Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Data Art series of webinars on trends, technology, and thought leadership. Today's webinar, titled Unleash Travel Data, Breaking Down Silos and Unlocking Opportunities with the Power of AI and ML, will focus on opportunities and risks associated with breaking data silos inside travel organizations. Please welcome our moderator, Head of Travel, Transportation, and Hospitality Practice at Data Art, Mr. Greg Abbott. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thank you for joining us for our continued webinar series covering technology trends in travel, transportation, and hospitality. Today, we're discussing opportunities and risks associated with breaking data silos inside travel organizations. And we'll touch upon the application of AI and ML use cases in this area. I want to encourage you, the audience, to engage directly with our panelists by asking questions through the chat function, and we'll work them into today's discussion. Okay, let's get started by introducing our fantastic panel for this session. First up, we have Anna Jaffe, CEO of Moby Systems, a company that's solving seemingly intractable human problems for hotels, transportation, crews, and airlines. Welcome back, Anna. How are you today? Good. Uh, yeah, great to be here. Thanks for joining us. Next up, we have Michael Reyes, Vice President of Offer Management at Sabre. Michael and his team drive strategy for products related to airline, air, airline retailing, shopping, pricing, and inventory. Welcome, Mike. So pleased you could join us today. Thanks a lot. Glad to be here. Next, we have Rick Sini. Rick, among many other things, is co-founder and CEO at Three Victors. And Three Victors is a travel big data and AI company providing airline revenue managers, travel marketers, and financial analysts unique insights into consumer demand and airfare pricing. Rick, we're thrilled you could join us. Thanks again. Great. Love, love to be here. Looking forward to a lively conversation. Well, let's hope so. We know, you, we know you'll help us there. Uh, next, we have Stan Boyer. Stan is a Data Art Advisory Board member and an airline industry expert with nearly three decades of experience helping airlines solve unique business challenges by designing transformational technology solutions. Thanks for joining us this morning, fam. Stan. Great, thanks for having me. Looking forward to the discussion. And rounding out our panel today is our very own Dr. Gene Kolker. Gene is EVP Global Enterprise Services and co-director of our AI ML Center of Excellence. Welcome, Gene. Thanks for joining the fun today. Thank you for the invitation. Happy to be here. Fantastic. Okay, if we're all ready, let's uh, set the stage, kind of give a little context here. According to industry data, COVID has changed consumer air travel search trends and booking patterns. Historical data and algorithms that relied on older trends and patterns are less effective now. And we're seeing that even some airlines uh, set their prices and routes based on online search and booking data. And they have regular meetings now between capacity planning and operations, revenue management, and sales departments to share information across these data silos in their organizations. Does this mean that some or even all existing revenue management players and products are now less relevant? And how is a pre and post COVID approaches to revenue management different? Um, Mike, given your deep background in revenue management, uh, let's start with you. Yeah, that's, um, I'm happy to. So um, I would say the systems are maybe not broken, but they're definitely not uh, as useful as they have been historically. And let me give some context as to why. So um, an example is one of the core kind of tenets of revenue management is that it works on the law of big numbers. So lots and lots of observations over time, and you can make predictions um, that the future will more or less look like the past. And that works because if I have 100 seats on an aircraft and I'm only selling four or five products, so imagine like a walk-up last-minute product, a 21-day advanced purchase product that has a Saturday night stay. If I have a model that looks like that and I can get enough observations of customers purchasing those four or five flight products, I can make statistically significant predictions for the future. Well, what's happening today is when I explode that product set, by adding prepaid bags, meals, Wi-Fi, seat assignments, all these, all these things that airlines are into now, all of a sudden, no two of my customers are, are ever buying the same combination. 
And so I don't have these repeating observations that I can use to forecast the future accurately. So the standard deviation goes up. As a revenue manager, I'm not as certain about when to stop selling one product and start yielding up to another. And that's what's behind the scenes in almost all of these revenue management systems. And that kind of uh, leads us to, well, okay, the system isn't broken, but because of the change in some of these assumptions that are, uh, you know, you know, back in, in uh, we came up with, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, the market has changed. Yeah. What do we need to do? And we need to advance kind of more modern techniques around experimentation, sampling, AI, ML. And that's where you see the, the really clever uh, airlines are going these days. It's They're not ripping and replacing their systems, but rather they're getting smarter about what the system was designed to do versus what's the problem we're, we're facing now. That's a great point. Does anybody have any other thoughts? Yeah, or? no, I would agree with with Michael too that the era of forecasting with two years of seasonally adjusted data is pretty much over. And I also agree with sort of the premise too, the top of funnel shopping signals like social media, Google search, bit.ly link shorteners, events, dedupe search, which we specialize in, for example, um, they're showing good promise in augmenting forecasts. I don't think you'll ever get rid of the old way you've done forecasts necessarily, but augmenting them for sure. But that's still in its very early stages. Um, and I, th I think one of the other things I might mention too is when you have these organizational data silos, there's a really interesting article you can Google MasterCard, but you have this share nothing and share everything models now where you have data lakes within an organization. So share everything model is everybody gets access to everything except the most sensitive bits, as opposed to nobody gets access to every, anything and uh, uh, your manager will help you get access to what you need. In order to for all these organizations and silos to speak with each other, they need immediate access to the non-sensitive data assets. Yeah, I think, I think we've seen, so you, um, Greg, mentioned search. And I think one of the things that we've seen is um, that search is like, that's a, a global piece of information, right? It tells you what the masses are doing. It doesn't tell you what the people who are traveling with you specifically are doing. Um, and each brand has its own set of customers, right? Who are loyal to it, who have their own behavior patterns, their own preferences. Um, and so one of the things that we've seen, um, we work B2B, like you said, with lots of different travel companies, Um doing routing, planning, personalization, basically using the traveler um, as their own unification of silo, right? Like their unification of yeah. self. They know everything about themselves. They know what, what they're going to do. They know when they're going to do it. Um, you know, they know what they want. So helping companies build tools to extract that information where it's direct engagement with your customer to understand where they're going and when. Um, and we had zero traction from any of the airlines. We were just like, we're never going to work with airlines. <laughs> it's just not even, we work with travel, transport, hospitality, not airlines. <laughs> but, um, and coming out of COVID, one of the things we've started to see, um, like maybe 60% of the airlines that we've approached in the last two or three months have said, hey, what we really want is to ask our people when they're going to travel and where they're going to go and what they want to do while they're there and how many days they're going to go and how much they want to spend. And we want to do that within the context of of supporting them right like in and providing the products and services and capabilities that they need and want to feel comfortable traveling and getting to see their grandparents who they haven't seen in forever and um, really just sort of like totally upping our digital game so i think that that's to me that's the most exciting thing right because that's direct data on the on the customers who are loyal to you who are going to travel with you and then you're not having to add an extra layer of noise trying to translate a search signal for Google um, to, to your particular customer base. Um, not that to the previous point, not that forecasting is dead or using search overall isn't a good strategy, but the, the, the piece that we add is really just direct engagement with the individual customers to know. That's a great point. I, I think you've all brought up really fantastic points, but I'm, I'm interested to know how they're tying together. So, um, you know, this that the paradigms have changed so dramatically in, in such a short period of time for companies that have been doing things, airlines have been doing the, the same way for 30 plus 40 years. Like, what does it mean under the hood? What's happening uh, beneath? How are they getting these data sets if it's from the, from the digital aspect, from the, uh, the traveler, or if it's from third-party data, are they buying Google Trends? Like, how are they, and, and how is that coming together underneath uh, 
to, 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 to make decisions on revenue management? I think um, on our side, they're not. <laughs> and that's the biggest challenge, <laughs> right? Because the revenue management team for us has always been the most uh, protective, I think, of their role and what they do, which is really, I mean, they're really critical to their organization. And if they mess up, it's a huge problem. So it makes a lot of sense. But um, so far, actually, that has been, that is the sticking point. It's that like, they're almost two parallel sets of information. Um, and they're trying to make business decisions off of two, yeah, two, that, that is the silo for us, this sort of real time right now and in explicit information um, and, and the historical systems. We haven't seen uh, a connection between them two on our side. I, I would say there's a couple different things. I mean, historically, there's been government data sets that everybody has access to, a variety of governmental data sets. There's the old standard MIDT booking data. So, by the way, the T stands for tape. That tells you how old it is. And it's certainly in need of some upgrade in the, in the acronym. Um, all these data have all sorts of issues with them, and there's several companies that try to enrich them and, and uh, do a variety of things with them. There's some of these new data sets uh, that are coming in as well. Um, and I think part of the problem is in order to spin up a data science department, if you want to have true data science, which is a data science unicorn, which is about a third computer science, a third mathematics, and a third subject matter expertise, you have to pull resources from your organization to create that unicorn. And it's expensive, and there's not been a lot of money spent the last 14 or 15 months. So that's certainly a big headwind on moving into the next generation of what I will call near real time. We started doing doing real-time data stuff two or three years ago. We're way ahead of our time. We're still trying to get people to weekly. Sometimes it's monthly, you know, processing of data. To get them intraday is my new goal <laughs> starting the next couple of years. That, that's uh, a really interesting uh, point, Rick, is the, the technology has changed so fast um, uh, just in general. So if we think of how these systems came into be, back in the day, computer com uh, computing power and storage those are actually precious commodities. So you'd only actually take observations every few days. You'd, you'd check for new bookings a week at a time and you'd, 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 you'd check back closer as you got to departure. And we didn't do that because it was ideal is because you couldn't afford to store all that data, right? We used to only have 26 inventory buckets. And the reason is because there were 26 letters in the alphabet and the computer systems only allocated <laughs> a single character field for that. And that's not the case now with, with cloud computing, improvements in, in processing, we don't care as much about storage and computational load as we did even, even 10 years ago. And now that um, COVID has really changed the game and there isn't as much at risk for those revenue managers, we're starting to see kind of cracks of, okay, maybe I can go and try something different because exactly. the silver lining is that you know nothing's working mm -hmm. in the traditional sense right now. So maybe I can take a few risks and, and be a little bit more kind of responsive to the market. It's even better because the cloud is super elastic. So used to you had to buy hardware to your worst case scenario. Now, essentially, you can go try a, a, an, MI, an ML AI model that you're working on. You can run it for a couple hours, allocate 4,000 machines and pay $10 because you're buying data on the spot. You're buying machines on the spot market. So there's plenty of ways to start to use some of these new techniques. Right. And, and I would also it, add. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Stan. No, I was going to add, Greg, that that to to both of the the points that were made here, to all three actually, is that the velocity of data has increased. And I know that you may still be struggling with, you know, some carriers to get data on a weekly or or monthly basis. But in fact, um, some of the vendors have worked really uh, really hard to now provide real time booking and ticketing and departure control data. Uh, that can be distributed in a near real-time manner. And when I say in near real-time, that's sub-second uh, to any downline applications. Now, granted, that's for a single carrier only. However, um, it allows them to see a broad spectrum of all of their travelers in a very short amount of time. And that can also then be married up with things like real-time shopping data um, that uh, some of the airlines would have access to. And so once you're able to start to marry those together, uh, to Mike's point earlier, the, the revenue management applications and the applications that consume that uh, are then able 
I think you have the beginnings of, of an AI ML uh, environment. The, an interesting thing I might mention too, by the way, is yeah. not only the velocity, but you also have, uh, there's a great report from Forrester from 2018 called the half-life of data. So the efficacy of data is, is now entering into much shorter cycles as well. Right. You, you, you guys have brought up so many good points. I'm trying to scribble some notes here to kind of unpack some of this. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to rewind a little bit. Um, and, and ask a question about uh, cloud enablement on these platforms, you know, GCP, AWS, and the like. Is that kind of a baseline to unlocking silos? Is that uh, companies kind of they, it's, they they have to have uh, some some amount of uh, data in cloud infrastructure that allows them to capitalize on these tools or I don't think it's necessarily required, but it's certainly Mm -hmm. nice to have. Um, (laughs) There's a lot of almost uh, these huge corporations are all they're going to have a hybrid cloud of some sort because moving their entire lifting and shifting their entire previous thing is almost impossible. So uh, I think you have to utilize that where it makes sense. And data science is the perfect place. Uh, Data lakes, you have things like Snowflake, which is cross cloud, which is allows you to access all sorts of interesting new relatively new technologies in the area of data lake and data warehouses um, around lakes of data and essentially bringing in data in its native form and not spending all this time trying to synthesize it, put it in a data warehouse and then divvy out access. It's like everybody has access to it. We'll all talk about it. And again, it's one of these things where you need to get all the departments and because really a good uh, machine learning model is about subject matter expertise and saying these 22 features make sense for this model and that can't be done by just a computer scientist or a mathematician and we have a question from from the floor um and if you will um so i think that was uh, related to one of the, your statements um so what is the cost of starting doing uh something with uh, uh perhaps revenue optimization and based on the data? What's the initial investment? How that looks like? What are the risks, investment risks associated with that, just just to start? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Um, Philip Wolf, who was on our board and passed away relatively recently, we wrote a piece on data um, a couple weeks before he died. And one of the, I don't know, I guess challenges that we put in that piece was that companies really uh, prize their data, right? If you think about like McKinsey and Bain and all like what all of the consultants do, they come in to these organizations, they have tons of access to the organization, they provide tons of capability and service. Um, but I think that companies are more hesitant to work with outside players when it comes to data and data analytics. And one of the challenges that we've seen there is that a lot of times the services make the AI model, the data, whatever, it doesn't have to be AI ML, right? The math, uh, they black box it from the partner. And as a result, the partner doesn't feel that they have control anymore over what's going on with their customers. Um, And because when you're talking about something like what product does a customer see and when do they see it and how do they engage with it and how is it priced and um, why is it matched to them? That feel like, that's like, telling me I should be friends with someone without knowing them, you know, and like knowing why I like them or why I dislike them or how I should talk to them. So one of the things that we found um, is like, we, we provide about 64 like services, routing, planning, personalization. And one of the things we've changed is to make basically the, the underlying algorithms and math models much more transparent to the customer and say, look, like for this one thing, there, this, this, this isn't, I mean, it is RIP, but it isn't RIP, right? Like the weights are yours. The model is yours. The insights are yours. Treat us like you're on your team. Like treat us like we're McKinsey, like give us the same access. Um, and if you do that, then the cost is quite low, right? If you, to, I forget who mentioned, like start starting a team, right? Building an internal team is very, very expensive, right? The really good people can be 500K or a million dollars a year. And you don't even know that they're the right person for your organization or like the problem you need to solve necessarily. So um, I, I think great. one of the bringing the cost down is is starting to trust that there are companies out there who can collaborate on these types of really core 
uh, products and services in the same way that data art does front end, right? Like you build the front end digital experience for your customers um, in the same way that we want to build a unique digital back end experience. Um, and just as you're transparent and share and feel like part of the team, right? Ideally, I think the back end services need to get that close and, and feel that close for it to work and for the cost to come down for experimentation. Uh, Thank you, Anna. I, 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 I was gonna, I was gonna ask you, Gene. Yeah, yeah, Gene. I was gonna yeah. ask you to chime in. <clears throat> yeah. So, so um, just building on Anna's answer and what uh, Rick was saying before, and, and Mike's comment. You know, there are four uh, kind of based on different surveys by a lot of organizations, like four major uh, challenges in AI ML adoption nowadays. And the first one is absence of expertise, like data scientists, data engineers, right? And like, again, reiterated again, that it's very expensive. It's, it's hard to find, especially within your own walls, right? That's number one. Number two, usually uh, data, uh, data silos, data quality is, is coming usually as a second you know, challenge, okay? And that's a major issue, especially uh, taking into account what we just discussed, how, you know, real-time experience is different right now in uh, COVID, uh, after COVID times, right? Third one is actually an interesting one, uh, like maybe surprising, is actually um, um, absence of alignment between um, data science, ML, AI models, and business uh, priorities, business outcomes, business use cases. This is actually a very interesting one that, this is supposed to be, you know, joint work between subject matter experts, like you know, Mike and and, and Rick mentioned uh, before, and um, in data experts, and that's not happening. And number four, um, which is not surprising, at least um, for some, is culture, uh, like Anna was telling about, right? You know, people are a little bit hesitant. They consider their data as a little bit as their like closed ones, good ones they like, right? And they don't like to share. And they sit on this, uh, you know, fantastic data resources and, you know, not exercising it. So um, maybe question for an our esteemed panelists, what do you think uh, would make it or break it nowadays? Pre-COVID time is very different from nowadays. What now, what are these key openers? What do you think, uh, you know, people should consider nowadays how to, to become, you know, a little bit more, you know, adventurous, you know, and, and try and do different approaches. Michael, you want to take that one? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll talk about a, a specific example that we were doing. Uh, it started pre-COVID and we hope to pick uh, some work on this back up now that people are recovering. Um, but I, I think it, it speaks to kind of how to, to do this kind of practically. Um, I'll talk about stopover promotions, and this isn't actually a new concept. And many airlines with big hubs try to push activities uh, for like a long layover or a stay. Uh, famously, Iceland Air and Reykjavik does this. Uh, others have similar concepts with big hubs. So what we've done with one airline um, in Asia is we started using machine learning to make hotel recommendations. Um, all, we actually started small in order to kind of prove the value. We did this, what I'll call offline or post booking. And so we helped the airline mine all their existing bookings, looking for people that had long layovers, six hours or more, things like that. And then they'd, they'd plug into their email marketing tools and reach out to those customers with promotions and, and sometimes a, a hotel. And they started seeing results. So, you know, they could justify a business case because they, they were, you know, having higher conversions. They were, you know, had their metrics they were hitting. And that was able to have them justify spending a little bit more uh, investment, resource, et cetera. And we started moving to what I would call more online or pre-booking or in the booking. So as a customer would search in real time from a point A to point B itinerary, we'd uh, spin up a machine learning model that would segment uh, the customer based on, you know, lookalikes and historical data, et cetera. And we'd return in real time. So think of this as, you know, very high level business versus leisure, but kind of some of the examples that Anna was talking about, much more granular. Um, and as we'd return the shopping results, we'd actually say, you know, you could book an itinerary with a long layover, stay at this particular hotel or with this sightseeing option. And that machine learning driven segmentation was super important. So this is where the use case really matters because, if yeah. you've got, say, like a student or a backpacker uh, on your website, 
you're going to have a better conversion to upsell with things like hostels or a budget hotel than you would with, say, the, the Four Seasons for a business traveler. And so I, I think that was really instructive for us because it's really easy to go in and give a big presentation and have like the five layer cape showing, you know, self service analytics and this big data lake and all that. And until you can make it real with use cases so they can see, I can improve conversion, I can sell additional ancillaries, I can sell things that I wasn't able to sell before, it's really hard for uh, an organization to swallow uh, you know, a great big proposal and a big business case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would, I would add on to that too. We, for, I'll give you an example of time series data. Time series data is really important nowadays, which is timestamp data. A lot of people have log files for their websites with all sorts of clever data in them, clickouts, and when people do stuff. As it turns out, um, for especially websites, crawling um, and non-human related activity and getting true search intent um, is around 65 to 70 percent of all data is non-human intent. So if you just take your web logs and suck them in and assume that that's the number and try to correlate them with your bookings or a variety of other things, you're you're in really big trouble. Um, so algorithms to, for example, to take that time series data and try to detect and and it's not some of it's not nefarious. Like somebody goes to a kayak says, "I want to go to this destination on these dates." They call ten agencies. They those 10 agencies call three calls to get a thousand results. And now you have one intent issuing 50 or 50 requests. And that's really not the true intent, clearly. It's just one person making a query. That's a good example. And getting started, just the axiom in data science generally is 85% data prep, 15% on the problem. You really need to work on sort of getting data prep down to 40, 50% and working on the problem 50% of the time. Hmm. Fantastic insight. And I'm, I'm with and you we guys. have a question. Oh, go ahead, Max. Yeah, we have a question from uh, from the panel. Uh, sorry, from the floor. Um, so, what what are the risks and what are the uh, potential backfires of using AML for uh, hyper personalization? I think in a lot of cases, it's not relevant, maybe. <laughs> right? yeah. I think that the, <laughs> the challenge with using AI and ML. Um, is I, I, even some of what we've talked about, right? Like the data sources that we've talked about, well, they definitely can do um, what Mike was saying, right? Like the sort of in-context layover recommendation. At the end of the day, the person is the source of a lot, most of the insights on themselves, like the, the deep insights that you really need to know. So I think the challenge with AIML is uh, to, to try to use it for every, right? It's like the hammer nail problem, <laughs> um, is to try to use it for everything. Um, you know, it's, it's really good. Like we use it, for example, to predict how long someone might want to stay somewhere or what the, including forecast and like the plane status, how likely is it the flight's going to be delayed. But when, when it comes to actually understanding what that person wants, um, for the most time, most part, we just ask them, right. And there's, there's nothing AI ML in that. Um, that's very traditional, just UI, UX, um, you know, a, a front-end interaction. That, not that that data then can't feed into an AI ML model that over time gets hella good. Um, it's just that I think you have to be really aware of what the tool's good at and what it's not. Um, the other thing that we think about a lot is that we think of AI as like there's three variants on it. There's sort of like a pure digitization. There's AI, which is like computer vision or something, right? Trying to do something people do and just replicate it. And then there's what we call associative intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence, which in some ways is like extra, extra human, um, but it's solving problems that people can't at scales that people can't. And I think that that's the real opportunity of AI ML. Um, it's to do things that, you know, no matter how many humans you had working on it and how long they spent, they wouldn't find that insight. They wouldn't see it. And there are tons of things that our brains just are really not good at. So um, I, I think that, yeah, it's, it's really using it in the right place at the right time. Um, otherwise, you can get results that just don't feel at all relevant to the problem you're trying to solve. I know we're trying to get everybody interested in these techniques, but just a backdrop thing that's out there at the moment. Um, soon, probably at the end of the summer, we won't have cookies anymore. Um, so Google, Apple, right. um, Mozilla are removing cookies, which is one of those nice data points that Anna gets to use in some of her algorithms and Michael as well. And GPS data is going to become much more um, restricted as well. So while we're trying to get all this, this these cool data points, which are useful, those things are actually getting more restrictive uh, in the next several months. 
It's a great point, Rick. <clears throat> it's a great point. Does anybody else have, uh, it was a good question from the audience. Keep them coming. Uh, anybody else have any other thoughts on risk of uh, bringing in uh, AI ML projects into organizations? I think I, I agree with Anna in the sense that, that look, a lot of people say that humans are predictable and as individuals, right? We like to be that way. Uh, my, I have a statement that I always say that we are also uh, at the same time, always delightfully inconsistent. And so if I did something last week, I may or may not want to do that this week, right? Or I may want to do it differently than I did last week, having a learning uh, from that experience that's not necessarily captured in the data. And so um, as you're using these tools in order to understand that right now, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're looking for the answers. And, and I don't know that without data sets outside of the travel experience that you're going to be able to get to a, a true personalization model and that by grouping people together with what we currently have in the travel data you could uh, be very far off course if you're not careful with what you're attempting to do thank you stan one of the things that we, we you guys came up with so many good things right in the first like seven minutes of this thing i was scribbling notes one of the points that you brought up was <clears throat> um and I'll kind of lay the context here. Um, it's it's about this sort of um, massive crisis that happened to the industry and that the change that it's allowing and facilitating to some extent. And I believe that there's a real opportunity that companies that are willing to kind of embrace the crisis and, and make the most, never waste a good crisis, right? Um, they are thinking about how to break down these silos that don't normally talk together, right? MITD is a great example of something that came out what, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, that was a, a collaborative effort between companies to share data to help the entire industry level up, right? Is there some opportunity now with uh, data and, and things that are locked to, to reinvent that? Is there is there some way that the industry, which as a whole has been really cut, can come together and think about how uh, to uh, have MIT, MIDT data too, um, to some extent, or some collaboration, right, of, of, of frenemies sharing and talking about data, talk, or sharing data from, from different perspectives. Yeah, sort of like data is the new gold, right? So I know a lot of these large organizations that have data flowing through them, and we work with many of them, um, they have edicts within their company to monetize data assets. Um, and that doesn't lend itself to sharing too much, to, share. to be honest. Um, it, it would be better if they were competing on the algorithm and they all had sort of the same data set that they could afford. I think also the cost of something like MIDT, I think historically, if you went back and sort of charted what MIDT would cost uh, by decade, the last 40 years, it would be a lot less today than it was historically, for example. Um, sure. So, and I think the other part of it too is data use rights. I think it's complicated commercially because you want to put somebody's data in an algorithm that doesn't actually hand that, the output of that is some other thing, but who gets the use rights? And if there's a royalty associated with that data, mm -hmm. how do you decide what percentage of that algorithm is using that particular data set, for example? There's a lot of um, legal requirements around this stuff that still need to be fleshed out. Thanks, Rick. And there is a good question. Uh, can the benefits of AI ML overcome the increase in relevance from customers to share the data with vendors? So, you know, perhaps a couple of other. Is that question about like use cases? Uh, Examples as well. No, it's, uh, um, there is, uh, I think there was a point uh, where we made uh, the, um, you know, one of the points was uh, complexities was culture and uh, sharing and GD, uh, GPS and cookies sharing, uh -huh. right? So, so actually can AIML overcome the increasing relevance from customers to share data with vendors, I see the, right? So the value that AIML brings to the traveler out, yes. outweighs the restriction of, of them uh, where, where they don't have to share GPS data, or they don't have to share cookie data anymore. 
Uh, it's not necessarily okay. uh, just GPS data. There is broad, you know, relevance, you know, share data. Thanks, yeah, everybody. I, I think that I actually, my guess when I read that question is probably the person saying reticence instead of relevance. Um, so like the hesitance of a, a consumer to share information. And we haven't really seen that. I mean, if you think about how many apps everybody has on their phone and how many searches and how many, how much people tweet and use, like, I, I think that if we've seen um, that people do not like to share information if it doesn't produce useful results, right? But if you think about like Wayfair, for example, and the number of filters now, like I can say I want a 12 foot wide, 56 inch tall, 34, you know, whatever. And I want it to be made out of walnut and I want it stained in beeswax. And I, you know, I don't want it to have any urethane on it. Like there's no hesitancy by someone to say all of those things about the stuff they want in their house, but that's because they want to find the thing that they want in their house. Um, and so I think it's the same for travel, right? If you give someone a forum to share what they're looking for and what they want, so they find what they want, then a hundred percent. There's no problem. No, I think it's, it's less about everything. consumers. I think it's about Facebook, Google, Twitter, a variety of other ones that have all that data and aren't sharing it or don't mm -hmm. plan on sharing it in the future. Yeah. Um, I think that's a big problem, right? I, I think consumers are, I have a 21 year old daughter. She probably shares way more than I wish that she did, um, <laughs> you know, on the internet. So um, I think again, it's going to be, you have Amazons of the world, the Facebooks and the Googles, and are they going to make that such a walled garden that you can't get access to it. Then it becomes wisdom of the crowd data, which is much more anonymized data right. that you may or may not get. And that requires some pretty sophisticated um, MLAI techniques. Thank you. We do have another question uh, from the audience. What would be the recommendation for a startup airline in terms of revenue management technology? Obtain an off the shelf product from an existing vendor uh, staff of a data science, uh, data science department to employ AI ML technology, maybe some combination of the two or something else. I'll, uh, My, I'll, yeah. I'll take a swing at that one. Yeah. So um, the, the, probably the best answer is, well, it kind of depends what you're after, but I, I would say for a startup airline, the goal usually isn't to be making money day one. It's to try to survive, build brand awareness and a revenue, a traditional revenue management system, uh, which is designed to help you kind of efficiently manage perishable inventory and you know open and close classes, doesn't necessarily lend itself well to. Um, I just want to fill the plane, and I want to you know have a splashy one euro fare uh, introductory rate. I mean, you can do that, uh, you know, with Excel <laughs> in a lot of places. And so um, as the airlines grow, that's when they tend to say, okay, now I need to get some efficiencies uh, uh, of scale. And that's where you get into, you know, either uh, an off-the-shelf solution or some kind of combination of, do I want to bring in data scientists to help me price better, you know, manage my inventory a little bit better? So yeah, a long way around to say, I think it it kind of depends, but definitely uh, if you're starting an airline from scratch, uh, the whole point is for people to know you and fly you um, and not to try to uh, necessarily manage your your yield versus load in a traditional sense I would also Thanks, say Mike. being born in the cloud is not a bad idea if you're brand new absolutely <laughs> <That's true. laughs> don't let it get a hold of all your assets at the beginning yeah, mm -hmm. that's great um, i think the startup is it's really hard to believe that you can build you know large it department right so i think i would uh, uh, echo what michael just told us you know just survive for the next few years right then you can increase your chances to continue operating. And while you're surviving, please do bring new experience to your customers, right? It should be personalized. It should be something that your customers are gonna come back to you. I think and in this respect, AI and ML approaches, right? Whatever approaches you can use, outsource them, you know, uh, try to, to to implement those. You can learn a lot about your customers and try to to use AI ML to to make this you know experiences more effective, more um, you know to the point, real time as real time as you can. I think this uh, uh, after COVID uh, experience is very much about getting to near real time experience for customers. 
Well, this, I have to say, has been the easiest panel to moderate that I've had in a long time. Thank you. Uh, the the uh, conversation was uh, fantastic. We really touched on a lot of information. I feel like we own, almost have to have a, a follow-up uh, discussion because we are out of time. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Stan Boyer, Anna Jaffe, Rick Sini, Gene Coker, Mike Reyes. Appreciate your time. Have a great day. Thanks, Greg. Thank, thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.